Well, good morning. How are we doing? This is our first Sunday in the Lego Palooza Relationship Series. How cool is that? Uh, if you haven't noticed, there's Legos in the back. So if you're, uh, if you get bored, we have given you something to do this morning. So you have no excuse to not have some fun. Uh, but we're going to start. Okay, so as I said this morning, uh, today uh, kicks off our Brick Builders Relationship Series. Uh, and you can follow us along Facebook and Twitter. We have this fun new toy that we're playing with. Uh, so if you saw the slightly inappropriate tweet, that came from somebody else, not us, earlier. <laughs> All right, so uh, these are Legos that uh, John and Jackson are getting ready to play with. And um, my son, I think, has more Legos than any one person should uh, in our house. I think they're his favorite toy. Um, and I knew I had reached parental uh, achievement uh, one night when I was letting my dog out at 2 o'clock in the morning and I stepped on something which sent me immediately crumbling to the floor in agony. I flipped on the light and I saw that it was a very sharp, small Lego block. You have never felt pain until you step on a Lego block at two o'clock in the morning. But I knew I kind of reached that level of parenthood and uh, so Legos, because everything is awesome. So Legos, they only have one purpose. What is the one purpose for Legos? Anybody know? You build with them, right? So they only have one purpose to be built with. One small brick at a time. And some may argue that Legos have other purposes, like to unleash immense amount of creativity, or to build that castle, or that house, or that dragon. Or in our household, it's the Batman cave. Or for some, it's the Millennium Falcon. But these things cannot be achieved unless you build them one brick at a time, correct? So building Legos is a lot like the process of building a good, lasting, forever type of relationship. And these good relationships, these successful relationships, the relationships that in 15, 20, 30, 40, 50, 75 years, the couples are still together. They're still madly in love with each other, right? It's these couples who are grossing out all the youngins because they still like to kiss. It is these couples who committed to till death do us part. It is these ones that withstood the test, the trials, the ups and the downs. You see, these relationships were built and sustained from laying, like we do with Legos, one small brick at a time. So today we begin what will hopefully be the start or even the continuation of a lifelong journey of building our relationships one brick at a time. And so uh, these two remind me that um, throughout the week, and throughout the series, we're going to be giving away Legos. How cool is that? Brand new Legos. They're not used. They're not from my house. Uh, they were purchased on Amazon. Still in the package. So uh, we're going to give away Legos every Sunday. And then we're going to give away, lay, away Legos throughout the week. So uh, this morning, your task, the song that we just sang, comes from the movie Pitch Perfect. But in Pitch Perfect, it references another movie. The OG for uh, Don't You Forget About Me. So the person who responds, all right, so you need to get out your phone for this. We're trying something new. All right, so get your phones out. The first person to tweet at the church, so at Fairborn UMC, the name of the original movie that Don't You Forget About Me came from will win the Legos for this Sunday. See, they came to me and said, hey, we've got this really cool idea. Who we are, Samantha Green. Where are you at? Is she here? All right, Miss Samantha, come up and get your, uh, your Legos. Come on down. <laughs> well, welcome this morning. Uh, if you are new with us, um, this isn't the typical Sunday morning, uh, just so you know. It's not uh, typically this all kind of crazy. We are crazy in general, but uh, it was exceptional today. The boss is away, so the mice will play, right? And then how it goes. <laughs> well, again, welcome this morning to those of you who are here and those who are uh, watching online. Um, Aaron is uh, watching, or he said he was going to be watching um, as he recovers from ACL surgery. So, uh, boss, we're holding down the fort till you get back. Uh, but we love to hear uh, from you, whether you're here with us or uh, watching us online. So go ahead and continue to tweet and post. Uh, I love seeing them because I, I get them on my iPad as I'm preaching. 
And even if you don't verbally say amen, when I see him pop up, it's like a little digital amen and a little high five, how you doing, uh, to me. So go ahead and do that. I need to offer a brief uh, disclaimer this morning because we are looking at the scripture from Proverbs 31. And typically, Proverbs 31 is known as a ladies' uh, scripture. However, guys, uh, it is very much for you too as well. So don't leave me. Today's not the day to you get a free pass to take a few more Z's. Uh, although we do have uh, Legos for you to play with in the back. Um, so it's your call. So no matter where you are in the relationship scale of life, I guarantee that you'll hear something this morning that will change your perspective. And if not, again, we have Legos to play with. So go for it. So I have a question for you. Ready? How is your love life? Awesome. Excellent. That was better than the first service. I had moans and groans in the first service. <laughs> you see, I remember being asked this question by a good friend who happens to be laying at home in bed from ACL surgery. And, and he asked me this question, and it was a curious question for me because at the time he asked me, my love life was absolutely non-existent. There were no prospects on the Western Hemisphere, and the Eastern Hemisphere wasn't looking uh, any more promising. Uh, at this point in my life, I had maybe been, uh, and this is a, a, a stretch even, I had maybe been on four dates. I was 23 and had maybe been on four dates. And not like those are four dating relationships. No, no, no like four one-time dates, okay? Um, I think people thought I was a nun because that was pretty much the extent of my uh, relationship. In fact, um, last week when Aaron said I was going to kick off this series, with dating, my father actually leaned up to me and he said, because that's because you have so much experience in this category, right? I said, thanks, Dad. I love you too. So that being said, uh, I'm not sure that I am the qualified one to talk about dating uh, with the experience part. Um, but, you know, I, I believe that, that my story, part in, by in part, uh, God blessed me because of it. So here you go. Plus, I'm all you got. So you're stuck with me. So as I said, dating wasn't something I did. I wanted to, don't get me wrong. I, I really wanted to. Uh, it just never seemed to work or happen. Anybody been there? Man, not a single one of you. All right, well, this is going to be a little awkward for the rest of the worship service. So when, when I was asked this question, how was my love life, um, I, I paused in response, and, and I looked at, at Aaron when he asked me, and I said, you know, it's just great. It's perfect. You know, it's really awesome never going anywhere. It's fantastic never having anybody interested in you. And staying home at Friday night, you know, I love doing the whole solo slow dance thing. It's awesome. I've been told sarcasm is one of my better qualities in life. And I continued my lamenting in his, in his, uh, in his office, and he stopped me and he said, You aren't hearing me. I said, How is your love life? And by this point, I was slightly beyond sarcasm. And I was getting kind of frustrated with this question, because who was he to ask? He was married and didn't know the struggles of being single and a girl. It's like double bad bonus there. I mean, he had it easy. He had someone to go home to. And I don't know whether he saw the frustration in my, in my eyes and in my body language, but he said again, Megan, you're not hearing me. He said, how is your love life with Jesus? Oh, new perspective on that one. And I said, yeah, oh, it's great. We're tight. We're homies. We Snapchat every night. Uh, me and his disciple, Big Blue Jesus, we chat on Twitter often. <laughs> but in all reality, my love life with Jesus was more like my non-existent love life I just described. And so his question got me thinking, and it allowed me to do a lot of soul searching. You see, I love Jesus. I did. I went to church. I was the youth pastor, but I was just merely going through the motions. My relationship was static, and it was as far from where it needed to be as it could get. And in the midst of our conversation, uh, Aaron asked me if I had made a list. I said, I made my grocery list this morning. Does that count? He's like, no. He said, how about a list that you could pray over and give to God? And this list is going to include your needs and your wants and someone that you're going to spend the rest of your life with. And at first I kind of thought, okay, this is a little ridiculous. You're just doing this to preoccupy my mind from the sadness of singleness. 
But, you know, I thought, what do I have to lose? Can't get any worse, right? So I decided to write one anyway. And when I began to write this list initially, I was all over the place because, you know, I didn't know what I truly wanted in a husband because what I wanted didn't seem to be what I really needed. My list seemed more like the wants from a genie in a lamp, not what I was looking for in someone to spend the rest of my days. So I stopped writing. And I said, I thought, you know what? I need to do some praying. See, my relationship with Jesus needed to be worked on first. Look at that. I'm like echoing. <laughs> my relationship with Jesus needed to be worked on first. We love because he first loved us. It's pretty biblical. And we cannot love unless we have love and know love. So I did a lot of long, hard praying because I tried to be someone else so that the guys would want to go out with me. I changed my looks, my characteristics. I changed how I did things. I saw how women were portrayed in society, and I tried to be like that. I was trying so hard to be somebody else that a guy would want that for a few brief moments of life, I began to lose sight of who I was. I began to compromise who I was, and I began to compromise what my standards were. I began to lose sight of the most important relationship I have. And to lose sight of Jesus is really easy when the only candlelight you have on a Friday night is the flicker of the TV. But it's always in the waiting period that's the hardest, isn't it? It's often in the waiting period that we tend to forget that God is actually working behind the scenes. And if we are just patient, man, that's hard. But if we are just patient, we will see his glory revealed in God's time. Perhaps it is in this waiting period that we are being worked on. Maybe we are the ones needing to be transformed into the person, the person we are looking for, is looking for. Did you get that? Often it is in the waiting period that we are being transformed. We are being changed. We are going through a lot of stuff so that we can be the person, the person we are looking for is looking for. You with me? Or do I need to say it again? There you got it. You're golden, sweet as candy. Now I want to pause for a brief moment on this because I don't want you to think this just applies to, to dating relationships. Because it, it can work in any relationship. Are you the friend? The friend you are looking for is looking for. Are you the employee? The job you are looking for is looking for. Are you the grandparent? The grandkids you will have one day will need. Are you the player the team you are looking to play on is looking to have? Are you the follower the person on Twitter you are looking for to follow is looking for? Are you positioning yourself now for your future relationships later? Are you the person? Are you the man? Are you the woman the person you are looking for is looking for? So I ask you this question this morning. How is your love life? So whether you have a Gutenberg or a Google-based Bible, either one's cool with me. I want you to turn to Proverbs 31. If you don't have either, have no fear. I got you covered. So the book of Proverbs was written by Solomon. He was the wisest man uh, who has ever lived. So he probably knows a thing or two, right? And the scripture comes at the very end of the book. And I thought last night when I was looking at it, I'm like, how appropriate that he leaves women to the last part of Proverbs. Because he's saving the best for Last, see how I did that? So Solomon writes in Proverbs 31, verse 10, a wife of noble character who can find. Now, a wife of noble character, she is honorable and virtuous. These women are set apart from other women. They know who they are. They are strong. They are confident. These women know whose they are first. They know they are indeed beautiful and sacred. A wife of noble character who can find Solomon writes. Now, this doesn't mean that no one can find such a wife, but that she is of surpassing value to the ones that do find her. These women are rare and exceptional. They are not lined up outside your door waiting for you to come knocking. No, these women are hard to find. Their graciousness is special. It's different. 
Because these women are so hard to find one, she is found by someone. She is worth, as Solomon says, far more than rubies. She is worth far more than anything anyone can imagine. These women, these noble women, they just kind of ooze awesomeness. And more importantly, they ooze Jesus in absolutely every way. Now let me be clear, just because she oozes Jesus doesn't mean she is a bullhorn yelling, Bible thumping, going to hell if you don't follow Jesus is very instant type of person. Some of the most Jesus-like people I know have a very quiet faith about them. Their representation of Jesus and their relationship with Jesus is found in who they are, what they do and how they live rather than how loud their voice is. Make sense? A woman of noble character, Solomon says. Do you know someone like this? I know a lot of you. So I would say yes. Verse 11, her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. This noble woman is trusted by her spouse. He has confidence in her, full confidence. He knows that she only has eyes for him. He knows that she will not do anything to compromise the relationship, nor will she do anything to hurt the family. She treats her spouse well, and he treats her well. Their respect for one another is mutual. You see, their exclusivity in the relationship fuels the passion and romance. Did you catch that? Because I like this one. You see, exclusivity in our relationships, which encompass trust and faithfulness. Exclusivity encompasses trust and faithfulness. When that's present in a relationship, our passion and romance are fueled. That's pretty cool, huh? This is like the uh, friends, how you doing? I don't know about you, but I like romance. We all like romance, don't we? Just a little bit of it. We sing about romance. Isn't it romantic? I love relationship series, by the way, because there's a bunch of love songs that you can just throw in at any point. Because of their exclusivity, Solomon writes, they grow deeper in love with each other because they know their love is only for one another. And we're going to skip a bunch of scriptures uh, in this, but verses 13 through 27 describe what this woman does, why she is considered noble. These verses describe her heart, her generous spirit, her focus, her work ethic, her success and business practice. They describe how she goes above and beyond to take care of her family and those she loves. Verse 29, it's, or 28 and 29, her children arise and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many women do noble things, he says, but you, you surpass them all. Ladies, isn't this what you want to hear? I don't know about you, but if I heard that like every day, I, you couldn't touch me. I mean, don't you want to hear that your children, your family, your spouse will arise and call you blessed? That you can hear them say to you, you are the best there ever was and ever will be. A few weeks ago, Claire came into the living room with a book. Now, I need you to keep in mind, we've had this book for at least seven years. She's four. Three-year gap there. So she walks into the room with this book, and she's like, Mom, who got me this book? And I said, well, Claire, I think I did. She says, Oh, in her very dramatic, clear like voice. She says, oh, and runs over to me and gives me this big hug. She's like, oh, thank you, Mom. You're the best ever. I looked at her and I said, and don't you ever forget it. <laughs> I was the best ever, and apparently for her that day, I surpassed everyone anywhere. Don't you just want to hear that? Many women are noble. But you, my love, you surpass them all. And ladies, we just can't take it. We got to give it back too, because we can equally say to our spouses, you are the best there ever was and will be. I don't care what anybody says. I think you're hot. And you rock my world every time I see you. Don't you just want to hear that? Now, I know how great and perfect I am. But it's nice to hear that from somebody else, too. I know that when I catch a glimpse of these words, I am on cloud nine. John is incredible about telling me how much he loves me. 
He will look at me and he says, thank you for saying yes. And I say, thank you for asking. And he says, Megan, I love you all the way down to my Purkinje fibers. And for those of you not in the medical field, those are like the deepest fibers in the heart that exist. He says, I love you all the way down to my Purkinje fibers. And then I say, and I love you all the way from Genesis to Revelation. <laughs> he tells me how much he appreciates me and, I, and how he couldn't do things in life without me. And oh yes, ladies, he's all mine. But it's like he says to me, you are blessed. And there are many women who are noble, but you, my love, you surpass them all. Solomon continues, he says, Charm is deceptive and beauty is vain. Charm and beauty are not bad, and used in context, they work very well together. However, these things alone are inadequate reasons to date and marry someone. I need you to hear that. Charm and beauty aren't bad, and in context work well. But these two things alone are inadequate reasons to date and marry someone. Because if we constantly focus our attention on what's on the outside and pay no attention to what's on the inside, then we are setting ourselves up for failure. Charm is deceptive. We are not being our true selves when we are trying to charm someone. Beauty is vain. There's more to us, ladies and men, than our outer beauty, or what we think our outer beauty has to look like. You see, unfortunately, we are told by society and culture to want a Model X type of person. We are conditioned to want someone who is good-looking, successful, pretty, handsome, strong, muscular, tall, skinny, makes lots of money, has a nice car, pretty much the Victoria's Secret model or the equivalent to Ken and Barbie. Sadly, sex fuels our society and our advertising world. These images start at a very young age and they follow us. We are, whether we realize it or not, training our young girls to fit this sexy image of a woman. Have you ever stopped and looked at clothes? Good heavens. I think my four-year-old wears more clothes than some of the girls I see. It's on those moments that I feel like I have to walk around with a car full of like blankets and scarves and gloves and sweatshirts because they just look so cold. I just want to like give them more clothing to wear. But we as a society are teaching our children, our girls, our daughters, our granddaughters that sex sells and it will ultimately get you what you want. We are teaching our boys that what you see is more important than anything else. We are teaching them that this is the ideal model. This is the way that we should present ourselves, that this is what should be wanted. We are teaching our kids that it's okay to be used, traded, or discarded for something better. We are teaching them that we are only a commodity and nothing more. This is why Solomon writes to us, charm is deceptive and beauty is vain. And let me say this, whoever you date, or whoever you are in relationship with, whether that's just a coworker, a friend, whoever. If someone bases their sole opinion of you on how you look on the outside, do not bother with them. They're not worth it. Because I wanna share a little secret, okay? This is like inside scoop type of deal. What's on the outside, it doesn't stick around very long. If you talk to any married couple long enough, they will tell you that time does wonders for outer beauty, amen? Praise Jesus. Praise Jesus that John loves me for who I am because after two children, there are parts of my body that are not in the same place. Term is deceptive and beauty is vain and very fleeting. Very fleeting. But, Solomon writes, charm is deceptive and beauty is vain, but a woman, and we can even insert a man, a woman and man who fears the Lord is to be what? It's to be praised. We are back to our love life question, aren't we? We cannot possibly be the noble men and women we are called to be if we're not in a deep, intimate, passionate relationship with Jesus Christ. We cannot possibly be the men and women that our spouse and our children need if we do not fear the Lord. Now this fear isn't a terrifying, uh, scared half to death, deer in the headlights type of fear. This fear is a respectful fear. This is a, I know you are God and I am not type of fear. This is, I will honor you with my words, my actions, my appearance, and my lifestyle. I will honor you with all I have type of fear. So if you're seeking the love of your life, you must first start with finding and honoring and fearing the love of all life. Say it again. 
I don't want you to miss it. If you are seeking this morning the love of your life, you must first start by finding, honoring, and fearing the love of all life. You see, in order to be the person, the person we are looking for is looking for, our relationship with Jesus must come first. And then we can start looking at the physical relationships of life. Our relationship with Jesus will set the tone. This will set the precedent for future relationships that we will have. You see, when John and I met, he knew exactly where I stood. He knew that God comes first, always. In fact, the only one I love more than John and my kids is God, and that's exactly how it should be. Ladies, you and I have a special place in this world because no one, all right, this is our moment. Ladies, hear me out. No one can do it like we can, amen? I figured I'd get like a bigger amen out of that one. <laughs> no one can do it like we can. Be the woman then who stands for something. Be the woman that does something that matters in life. Be a woman that is noble and loves Jesus with everything you have. Because you and I have been called and set apart because you and I are daughters of the king. And that is good news. Men, women, boys, girls, teenagers, wherever you're at, you are beautiful, you are sacred, you are highly valued and loved because God created you that way. Never, ever, ever forget that. So you want a great love life? Anybody want a great love life? Okay, a couple of you. Excellent. Man, you guys are rough this morning. Sheesh. If you want a great love life, I want you to love God first. I don't care whether you're dating. I don't care whether you've been married for 75 years. If you want to continue to have a good love life, love God first. It's that simple. You want to marry the man or woman of your dreams? Seek out someone who absolutely fears the Lord. Seek out love for the right reasons. And in order to find the love of your life, you're going to have to look really, really hard for it. Because anything of high worth is like a treasure. It's often hidden and not easily found, but when you find it, hold on to it with every ounce of your being. And maybe you're already married. Kudos to you. So to those couples, I want you to be the couple who stands apart from the crowd. Be the couple who without a doubt love Jesus first and show it. Be the couple who appreciates one another and honors and respects each other. Be the couple who grosses out the teenagers and your kids. Have some fun. You only get one shot at embarrassing them. Be the couple that holds hands, opens doors, pulls out a chair for your spouse. Be the couple that kisses each other like you've never kissed each other before. Be a couple who continue to build on your relationship one brick at a time. You see, after months of praying and seeing that I was indeed loved and valued for exactly who I was, I finally wrote my list. This list looked nothing like it did at the beginning. It didn't have, he must be really hot. He must have lots of muscles and a six pack. And you know, it'd be okay if you're on People Magazine's Sexiest Man Alive cover. I'd be all right with that. But rather, my list had qualities such as, this man must love God as much as he loves me. He must respect me for who I am. He must want to be in ministry with me. And first and foremost, he must be a Steeler fan. <laughs> so I prayed over this list, and I felt confident in whatever God was going to do with it. And, and I had actually gotten to a point, and this isn't to brag or to boast or whatever you want to call it. But I'd gotten to the point where I said, you know what? God, if, if you never have anyone come into my life to spend it with, I'm okay with that. Because you're enough. You are enough for me. I could not have said that almost a year before that point. I had worked on my relationship with Jesus first. And he was enough. A few months went by, and I was in conversation with uh, someone, and she said, what do you think of firemen? And I said, well, they're pretty great. They run into burning buildings and save people. Kudos to them. She's like, no, what would you think about dating one? I said, oh, even better. And one month later, I met John Howard on a blind date. And then 364 days later, we were married on what 
was probably the most awesome day ever. I think heaven sang the hallelujah chorus the day we got married, by the way. But, you know, I would never have gotten to this point. I, I would never have gotten to that perfect moment in my life had I not taken the time to answer the question, how is your love life? To be honest, this question probably saved my life and my marriage. It allowed me to begin building our, my relationship with John before I even met him. It allowed me to work on that relationship one prayerful break at a time. And because I had the solid foundation built before I met him, when we met, we were able to continue to build on to the foundation that was already there. We have grown together in our relationship with each other and with God. And maybe you're thinking, well, you know what, Megan, that's all well and good, but I'm not there anymore. You know, I, I'm kind of coming into this in the middle of it. You know, I, I didn't have that foundation to begin with. Well, I have great news. Today is a perfect day to start. God's mercies are new every single day. So if you didn't start that building before, you can start now. If you want to continue to, to have a great marriage and a great love life and a great relationship with your spouse, start with Jesus first. Start building your relationship with him. Start that foundation now because it's not too late. We sang this morning, his love never fails. It never gives up. It never runs out. Start building your bricks one, or your foundation one brick at a time. So go ahead, grab some b bricks and build away. But make sure you build on the foundation of Jesus first. Amen? Amen. Go in the grace and the love of our Lord Jesus Christ this morning, knowing that he will wait for you. He will wait for you to start building that foundation on him. Know that he is relentless in his search and know that he loves you with everything that he has. I just want you to love him back. Be the noble men and women that you are called and created to be and start building your relationships and that foundation one small brick at a time. Go in peace. Amen and amen.